Amen. Well, go ahead and have a seat. Tonight we are talking about the law. It's a really big chunk of the Old Testament. It's something that's referred to a lot. And it's something that's sort of confusing sometimes to people like, okay, what was the law for? What was it there about? How does it affect us? There are people today who would tell us that we are still under the law, that we need to follow the law. There are certainly benefits to the law, but it's really important to understand kind of how it all fits in because it's a big part of our Bible. Um, in general, the law is what the Jews would call the first five books of the Old Testament. Um, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy. Co collectively, the Torah would be called the law. Um, specifically, the law that God gave to the children of Israel at Mount Sinai was actually, uh, although it's, it's found in some of those books, it's, as you get to the middle of the book of Exodus, um, Exodus chapter 20, where the Ten Commandments are given there on Sinai, and then on through all the book of Leviticus is specifically the law. It was a collection of a huge list, basically, of detailed rules. Now, we also, and we will look tonight later on, at the Ten Commandments, which are the, the centerpiece of the law. Everything that God told people to do ultimately is reduced to those Ten Commandments that that God actually wrote with his finger on stone. The, other, the rest of the law and all the other instructions were given out to Moses and to the people to follow and to study. But the Ten Commandments were the centerpiece of all of it. So we're going to talk about those in a, in a separate, in a, a little bit of a separate discussion. But the law, it was a huge list, like I said, of detailed rules. Um, some of them were dietary. And some of those are some things that, especially if you love lobster or something like that, you're like, well, why did they have rules against eating shellfish, for instance? Or, you know, why is it that an animal with cloven hoofs would be different than an animal that isn't? Um, what does it matter as you read there in Leviticus about you know, animals that chew the cud versus animals that don't chew the cud. A lot of detailed information about what they could and couldn't eat. And when we talk about the purposes of the law, we'll see how some of that fits in. But that's a big part of the law. There are also things in the law that seem like, for instance, I mentioned on your outline, childbirth. Rules about childbirth. If a woman had a child, she was unclean for 40 days if her child was a male. If her child was a female, she was unclean for 80 days. I didn't make the rules. I, I don't even necessarily understand what that's about. Some people have said, well, having a, having a girl is harder physically, and so it was just basically a gift to the woman to be able to have some recuperation time. I don't know, but that's... There are rules in there about that and all sorts of things about um, you know, uh, you know, when you could and couldn't have sexual relations with somebody based on uh, being you know, on their period and things like that. A lot of really detailed stuff regarding reproduction. Um, there are also things about infectious diseases such as leprosy and some other diseases where rules were given about how to know one disease from another and training the priests so that they would be able to inspect someone and evaluate what their condition was, especially regarding diseases that, that can be contagious. There's a lot of stuff about families, a lot of things about marriage. There is the instruction concerning divorce. And you know, basically, divorce was a way of protecting a woman where if a man you know, was just going to leave her out in the cold, he had to give her a writing of divorce, so that then, which was her permission to go and, and remarry. So laws about that, laws obviously about things like adultery, violating uh, you know, marriage vows, and, 
and what the, what the cost of that would be, the consequences of that, and many other things being death. Um, a, a lot of, there's a lot of stuff about child rearing and how, to, you know, how important it is to discipline children and to teach them respect and things like that. Much of it seems really harsh to our modern sensibilities, but um, it's all in there as a part of the law. And then I also mentioned that there are business things, like how not to loan money to people at interest, especially if they were Jews, because that's like taking money from your brother, making it impossible for them to repay and therefore having them become slaves and, and those kinds of things. There are laws about bankruptcy and how if you do get over your head, a, a lot of people don't realize today, some people feel like, oh, I would never go bankrupt. But built into the law was various levels of bankruptcy. It's where the idea came from. So that you would never get to the point where it was hopeless for you. So there was a way to negotiate through whatever situation you got yourself in so that it would be possible to start over. And in that, the, the greatest bankruptcy was the year of Jubilee, where every 50 years, everything reverted back to its original owner when it came to real estate and things like that. So it was, a lot of it prevented people from going into debt that they couldn't dig themselves out of. And so there are other rules in other areas, but those are some of the major things. So it's important for us to understand the purpose of the law. What was it there for? Because we can't know how the law affects us today if we don't understand what the point of the law was. A part of the law was just practical guidance for wilderness survival. A lot of these, for instance, these food regulations were in light of where they were going to be living in the desert, that it was, a, it was a shortcut way for them to know what's safe to eat and what isn't in that environment without refrigeration, without preservatives, without a lot of modern technology that could clean the stuff. A lot of the dietary restrictions seem to be, uh, some of it seems arbitrary, and we don't understand every one of the rules. Um, which wasn't even the point of the law because it didn't really explain it. But, but I think that an awful lot of it was in order to just keep them healthy in the circumstances in which they live. Now, um, over in Exodus 15, 26, as they are preparing to move forward and, and the law would be given to them soon after this, but Exodus 15 and verse 26, God says to them, and if you diligently listen to the voice of the Lord your God and do what is right in his sight, give ear to his commandments and keep all his statutes, I will put none of the diseases on you which I have brought on the Egyptians, for I am the Lord who heals you. So it would seem according to this that there were probably all sorts of communicable diseases that they had probably picked up on you know, from when they were in Egypt. Not only that, there are other references to diseases among the Canaanites when they would ultimately go into the Promised Land. Um, and no doubt that was the, the same thing was true for those people, Moabites and others on the east side of the Jordan River. And so it's, there's a good chance that some of what the restrictions of the law gave were very practical in terms of helping. And again, some of their food, we don't even know what it was, what it was like. We, there's a lot that we don't know, but, but God made this promise that I will deliver you from the diseases that these other people are suffering from. Years ago, there was a guy named uh, S.I. McMillan who was a medical missionary doctor, and he wrote a book called None of These Diseases, which the title of his book comes from Exodus 15, 26. And he goes through the law and explains over and over again how some of the meticulous requirements were actually medically good advice given their situation, given their time, given what was around in those days. And, and it's really interesting to look at it. Other people have done similar books where they've actually shown that even today, 
if you ate by the dietary restrictions of the law, that you'd be way better off. And there are a myriad of reasons. So a lot of these things in the law were just written to help them, to protect them, to help them to survive in, in this environment. And so that certainly, um, and like I say, I'm not a nutritionist, but experts tell us that the simpler your diet is on things that really matter, obviously they had no processed food or sugar or anything like that, so already you're ahead of it. But I mean, a lot of those shellfish that they couldn't eat were, had, you know, they were uh, scavengers, they still are. So when you eat that kind of stuff that eats garbage off the bottom of the sea, it's not that great for you. But some of it was that way, who knows? Uh, some of these things we still probably haven't discovered exactly why God said, don't eat this animal, but eat this animal. But there, there were certainly practical considerations to it and, and health concerns that were a part of the purpose of the law. But I think also part of the law was just moral guidance. It was to, to get people to just you know, treat each other better. A lot of that, a lot of the rules were uh, interestingly about protecting certain classes of people from exploitation. Uh, for instance, we read the law and go, it sounds like God thinks slavery is okay because he gives laws about how to do slavery. It also sounds like he thinks concubines are okay because he gives instructions about how to treat your concubines. Um, there are certainly, you know, the law of divorce, like I said, was to protect women who are getting divorced. And, and a lot of the instructions on debt were to protect people from being completely taken advantage of and, and going upside down and just being slaves for the rest of their lives. Um, you know, the, the, the moral guidance of the law is so often, and, and it really is, in a way, it's God dealing with society as it was. Don't think of the law as being God's perfect idea of how society should function in a perfect world. It wasn't that, it isn't that. Obviously, in a perfect world, there wouldn't be any sin, you wouldn't need any sacrifices or anything else. What God did, though, is write the law in a practical way, given the nature of their culture, given the nature of what their lives were like, in order to try to create buffers so that at least you know, those who would typically be of exploited classes, such as non-Jews who came and converted to Judaism, or those whose families had become poor and they therefore were in debt and became slaves, or those women who were treated like property when it came to um, concubinage or when there were multiple wives and things like that. God knew the way the world was, and he goes, okay, in your world, here are some things that I want you to do to make this more fair than it, w than it is anywhere else in your world. It's, you know, it, this is, so often we look at the world just in terms of today, and we think the way things are now, that's the way they should be. But and we see this throughout the Old Testament when you see God telling them to go in and, and kill a bunch of people and take their land. Today, that sounds like a horrible thing to do. And you go, how could God do that? But in their day, that's what would happen. That's how you got land. So if you didn't kill them, they would kill you. If you didn't destroy them all, they would come back and end up destroying you. So I look at it and go, oh, what a horrible time to live. And there's some truth to that. At the same time, I have to look at it in the context. So that, I mean, in our own country, if I look back historically, and I'm, I love our country and I'm so thankful for our country, but if I look back at, for instance, what we did to the Native Americans when we came into the land, I look at it and it just, it's disgusting and shameful. When I look at the influx of African slaves that, that were sold by their own people, shipped over here and then became slaves, and I look at it and go, God, that's so wrong. 
How could they not have known? How come when Jefferson said all men are created equal, he didn't for a minute think that that meant he shouldn't have slaves? It seems crazy to us today. But in actuality, there are things that go on. I, I could look at the way um, I just watched the documentary on O.J. Made in America about O.J. Simpson. And it does a, whether you're excited about O.J. or not, it, I, I've always been somebody who's interested in the case. That's why I watched, binge watched like six hours of it. But it does such a powerful job of showing what it was like to be black in America in the 60s and 70s and 80s and how they were treated and how important that was to the whole development of this case. Well, you can't go back and judge a society in the past based on what we understand and know now, except we can say, boy, I'm so glad that we don't live then. But what we have to do is look at this law in terms of he did make things much better for every class of people who were being taken advantage of, the exploitation and things like that. He gave rights to everyone. And so what God did in the law was radical, but it is not a description of the way society ought to be in a perfect world. It's the kind of laws that would allow people to get along with each other, to function in the world in which they live. So when we read the law, we have to recognize that. Were women considered equal in the law? Not really. I mean, they really weren't. And, and yet, in their culture, they were considered garbage. They were considered disposable. They were considered just property. Women had a lot more rights under the law, under the Old Testament law, than they had anywhere else in the world. In the same way that when Jesus comes along and he talked about you know, and Paul talked about that there's no male or female, that they're equal. That was a radical thing in their day. Now, you might look at it and go, then why wouldn't they let women preach or whatever? Well, again, it's, you can't set up rules that are going to cause everyone to completely reject all of the rules. You have to figure out where people are and find a way to negotiate through all of that to do the best that you can. So the Old Testament law is not the perfect standard of the way that everyone ought to live today. It's an example of a set of rules that allowed them to function and survive in that part of the world in that time in history. But So it certainly provides some moral guidance. And as we get into the Ten Commandments, we'll see. Primarily, the Ten Commandments are that moral guidance, like how can you live better? How can you be a better person? But the law also, an important function of the law is that it brought a sense of guilt. It helped you develop a conscience, and it caused you to realize, I can't even keep this law. It's just a few hundred rules, and yet no matter how hard I try, I break the, the rules myself. So, the law is set up to help us to realize, to begin to have a conscience and realize, man, I'm not as good a person as I thought I was. Um, to, to feel bad about certain things because if you don't have rules, you really don't know what breaking a rule is. And so the law put a set of rules in there and, and the idea was, wow, I sin. I come short of God's standards. I cannot follow the rules. There are a few people, like the rich young ruler, for instance, who when Jesus, he's, he wanted to follow Jesus, what shall I do? And Jesus said, well, obey the commandments. And he's like, I've done that since I was a little kid. And then Jesus said, okay, well then go sell everything you have and give it to the poor and come and follow me. And he was like, oh. Sometimes we need something. And sometimes we miss an opportunity. When we mess up, when we sin, that can be a really important part of our development to realize that we shouldn't be cocky about thinking that we are righteous. That when we have a law and we really look at it, that I'm not judging other people for the commandments that they're breaking because I look at that list of commandments and I'm like, there's no way in the world. Now when, when God, and you can read in Exodus, when, when God gave the law, Moses read all of these rules to the people. 
And their a sensible response would have been, how in the world are we ever going to follow this? But what the children of Israel said in one voice together, they said, all that the Lord has said we will do. How did that work? I mean, Moses came down from getting the Ten Commandments, and they're already sacrificing to a golden calf and dancing around worshiping a calf. And then Moses' brother lies about the whole thing. It's ridiculous. They didn't understand. These rules should have overwhelmed them. But instead, they thought, yeah, we can do that. No problem. I'm good. I've heard of Christians saying that, you know, it's been months since I've sinned at all. I'm like, what? Months? I, I try to go minutes. <laughs> Mostly when I'm sleeping. Yeah. But, but, you know, it's like, the purpose of the law is to let you realize you can't keep the law and to cause you to recognize I need outside help. I need to be saved. I need to be rescued. The whole sacrificial system was such an important part of the law where they would bring an innocent animal and sacrifice it and that would cover their sins for a time. But they had to keep coming back and doing it and the scriptures tell us that the, the blood of bulls and goats can never, can't take away sin. It could provide some sort of, a, of an associative covering for it is about all that it would do. But it set people up to recognize, I need someone to save me. If I am going to be rescued, somebody else is going to have to do it. I can't save myself. And that's an important part of the law. It, it brings a sense of of guilt. It causes you to realize what you can't do and you recognize, I need help. That should always be the response to the law. Now, turn over to Romans chapter 3. Romans chapter 3, verses 19 and 20. Look at this. Paul says, now we know that whatever the law says, it says to those who are under the law, so that every mouth may be stopped to shut you up, and all the world may become guilty before God. Therefore, by the deeds of the law, no flesh will be justified in his sight, for by the law is the knowledge of sin. The law should shut your mouth, should cause you to realize you need a savior, and should cause you to understand, as he says, I'm just guilty. I'm guilty before God. I can't stand and say, I'm good just because I'm better than someone else. Then in Galatians chapter 2, Galatians chapter 2, beginning with verse 16, Paul says this, knowing that a man is not justified by the works of the law, but by faith in Jesus Christ. Even we have believed in Christ Jesus, that we might be justified by faith in Christ and not by the works of the law. For by the works of the law, no flesh shall be justified. But if, while we seek to be justified by Christ, we ourselves also are found sinners, is Christ therefore a minister of sin? Certainly not. For if I build again those things which I destroyed, I make myself a transgressor. For I, through the law, died to the law that I might live to God. I have been crucified with Christ. It is no longer I who live, but Christ lives in me. And the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. Paul was so concerned in the book of Galatians. The main focus that he has in this book is to deal with those people who were still trying to say, you're under the law. You need to follow the law. You need to do what the law says. And he's like, no, nobody could be saved by that at all. That simply does not work, nor was it ultimately the point of the law. The point of the law was not for sins to be forgiven. The point of the law was that you can't get your sins forgiven. You need someone else to substitute for you. 
And the last verse in this section uh, in Galatians 3, verse 24, Paul says this, Therefore, the law was our tutor to bring us to Christ, that we might be justified by faith. So according to Paul, as he wrote to the Galatians, the point of the law was to help us to learn things about ourselves, to learn things about our own incapacity to deal with our own sin. It gave enough rules that you felt like you were busted no matter what you did. And he said, all of that was God preparing you like a, like a school child that you are coming to the point where you realize that you need Jesus. We need to understand this as we read through the law. All of this ultimately means nothing unless it leads you to the Savior. If someone wants to continue to live by the law, to live under the law, for instance, Jews who today just believe that without Jesus they can just follow the law, you got a problem. For one thing, it's not legal in most places for you to even sacrifice, so you can't even cover your sins. But secondly, following the law is something that's impossible to do. You need a Messiah. You need someone who will die for you so that your sins can actually be forgiven. So, you know, the, turn over to Matthew 22. This is such an important verse because they were questioning Jesus about, okay, there's a bunch of rules in the law, so what are the most important ones? Can you give us a Cliff Notes version? Because there's hundreds of commandments. Can you tell us at least where to start, what to work on first? And he says in verse 36, well, they said, teacher, what's the great commandment in the law? This was a lawyer asking him, breaking the first law of lawyers. As a lawyer, you're not ever supposed to ask a question unless you know what the answer is going to be. Um, But he said, what's the great commandment? Jesus said to him, quoting in Deuteronomy 6 in the Shema, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind. In one of the other gospels he throws in there with all your strength. He said, this is the first and great commandment. And the second is like it. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. On these two commandments hang all the law and the prophets. So he says, basically the whole Old Testament is about this. Love God with all your heart, soul, mind, strength. Uh, In the Hebrew it says strength, but in the Greek translation of the New Testament it said mind. And so at one point Jesus actually includes them both. But basically it's like everything that you are needs to be directed in love toward God. That that's what the law is trying to say. And then it's trying to say, love your neighbor as yourself. Now that, that first part, love the Lord your God with all your soul, mind, heart, and strength, is from originally, it's quoted a few other places um, in Deuteronomy, but originally it's in the Shema. It's called the Shema, Deuteronomy 6. And Shema is a Hebrew word for hear. And what he writes there is, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. Thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, with all thy soul, and with all thy strength. And so he's quoting the Shema, which is something that an Orthodox Jew would pray every day. The Lord our God, the Lord is one. It's why a lot of Jews reject Christianity, because they think that we believe in two gods, or three gods, and, but based on the Shema. What's interesting is in Deuteronomy 6, the word for one, the Lord our God, the Lord is one, is the Hebrew word echad, which refers to a compound unity. It's the same word that's used in Genesis when it talks about the two becoming one flesh. So they misunderstand that, but he, he does that, and then he takes from Leviticus 19, 18, and says, and the second is like it. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. So basically, everything in the law, according to Jesus, is summarized by this. Love God with everything you have, and love people the way you love yourself. Treat people the way 
you want to be treated. And if you do that, it's a shortcut to all of these rules. It's all that the law is trying to say. Jesus lays it out there, makes it so simple. And it's so, you know, if we want to remember anything tonight about the law, let's remember that it's all summed up. Just two things. Love God with everything that you have and love your neighbor the way you love yourself, the way you take care of yourself. That fulfills all of the law. Now I want to take the minutes that we have left to talk specifically about the Ten Commandments. Uh, Ten Commandments are also called the Decalogue, you know, the ten words, basically. And you find them in Exodus chapter 20 and in Deuteronomy chapter 5. <coughs> it tells us that, I mean, these are a big deal because God actually wrote these Ten Commandments on stone tablets. Now, he had to redo it because Moses was mad when he saw the children of Israel worshiping a calf, and he threw them down and broke them. God's like, that was the original. But it appears that God ended up going ahead and writing it again. These Ten Commandments were so important that later when God had the children of Israel build what was called the Ark of the Covenant, Indiana Jones finally found it and put it in the Smithsonian. But before that, in the, in the Ark of the Covenant, which is what sat in the Holy of Holies, the holy place, and it was where the presence of God dwelt over these angels that were on the lid of this thing. Um, inside the box, one of the three things that were in the box was the original plates of the Ten Commandments, along with a bowl of manna, along with Aaron's rod that had budded. So these are a big deal to God. Now, and you, you might have heard me You might have heard me, sorry, it was distracting. You might have heard me teach on this before because when I teach memory, I usually use the Ten Commandments as an example of what you can remember if you use proper associations and therefore you can remember the Ten Commandments. So I think on your handout you have one is run, two is shoe, three is tree, Four is door, five is dive, six is sticks, seven is heaven, eight is gate, nine is vine, and ten is hen. They're just rhyming random words, but when you're remembering ten things, if you can remember those, you can remember the things, okay? So I wrote it down for you so I didn't have to drill you over and over again. I knew we would have limited time. But each of these is going to be associated with one of the commandments. So... Number one is run. The first commandment is, you shall have no other gods before me. So here's what I want you to picture in your minds, and I know this sounds stupid to you, but years ago I did it and it was on the radio and Pastor Chuck told me, I can remember the Ten Commandments now because of those cartoons that you told me about. So uh, there you go. If you think you're smarter than Chuck, you don't need to do this. But... It's funny, most people don't know the Ten Commandments, even though we, a, a while back when they were arguing over whether they could have the Ten Commandments, you know, there in federal courthouses and things like that, they had a bunch of congressmen who were arguing vociferously in defending the Ten Commandments. And they asked each of these congressmen, can you tell me what the Ten Commandments are? And none of them knew the Ten Commandments. Most of them could only get two or three of them. And so you can be smarter than they are. Okay, one is run, have no other gods before me. I want you to picture, don't just think it, but actually see it happening. There's a race. And the guy in front is wearing a big crown because he represents God. All these other phony little gods, whatever it is that in your mind you can think of as a cheesy god, cartoon characters, celebrities, whoever. They are behind, and he is crossing the finish line first because he will have no other God before him. So run, first commandment, nobody ahead of God. Okay, got that? To his shoe. Second commandment is don't have idols. Don't don't worship idols. Don't be materialistic, in other words. 
And so just imagine whatever you think in your head of an idol, a little statue. What I think of is years ago I had this, this totem that came from, you know, it was like buried deep in the ground. It was a Mayan thing that somebody, a friend of a friend, had stolen it from a construction site, uh, which is a long story. But I had it in my office for a long time, and then I thought I'd probably better get rid of it. But, you know, I picture that thing taking a shoe, because to a shoe, and just smashing the idol, okay? So imagine yourself doing that, smashing an idol. Three is tree. Third commandment is, don't take the Lord's name in vain. So just imagine there's a tree, and you're carving God's name on the tree. And he's like, no, you can't do that. If you, if you want, you can even see that it that it touched a vein of the tree and sap was running out, if you want to make a really detailed picture. But the point is, you know, don't use God's name in vain. Carving God's name on a tree, three is tree. Four is door. Imagine the fourth commandment is keep the Sabbath. Keep that seventh day holy and don't work on it. So, so you have a door and it's just latched because it's a Sabbath. So on the Sabbath, what you do, it's Saturday, your door is locked because it's the Sabbath and you're just not going out, you're not going anywhere. Four is door, fourth commandment is keep the Sabbath. Five is dive, like jumping off a diving board. I want you to picture yourself getting up on a high dive and you're ready to do a dive. By the way, the, this, uh, the fifth commandment is honor your father and mother. So picture your mother and father sitting there watching you, and you do this amazing dive. And then you get out and you go, that's for you. I did that dive to honor you. And you get a ribbon for it, and you take your ribbon off, and you give it to your parents. Five is dive, honor your father and mother. Six is sticks. The sixth commandment is don't murder. So picture a murderer... If you, I used to tell people, most people, when they think murder, they think of O.J. Simpson. I still don't actually believe he did it. Sorry, but, but think of somebody who's a murderer, and they just give everybody sticks, and they're just beating on this murderer because he committed murder, and you're beating on him with six. Six is sticks, don't murder. Seven is heaven. Seventh commandment is don't commit adultery. So let's just say... That you imagine this, this isn't true or biblical, but somebody goes to heaven and Peter at the gate says, you committed adultery, you can't come to heaven. We just don't have adulterers here. Again, that's not doctrine, that's just memory, okay? So seven is heaven, adulterers don't go to heaven according to my scenario in actuality. They're forgiven, they certainly can. Eight is gate. You have a gate out there on your front the front part of your house, the reason you do that is for security, right? So the eighth commandment is don't steal. Do not steal. You have a gate there to keep people from stealing your stuff. But somebody actually comes and gets your gate and runs off with it and actually steals the gate itself. So eight is gate. Nine is vine. And the ninth commandment is don't bear false witness. So the cartoon, I want you to remember to see it in your head or to write it down so that you can review it later, it is a, a bear that's swinging on a vine, nine is vine, and he comes swinging into a courtroom and lands in the witness seat, and he just begins to lie like crazy. People are like, you're lying, that's, that's, you know, you're bearing false witness. He goes, I'm a bear, that's what I do. Swinging on the vine, I'm bearing false witness. That's nine. The tenth commandment, ten is hen, like a chicken. The tenth commandment is don't covet your neighbor's house and don't covet your neighbor's wife. So all of that is in the tenth commandment. So a hen, picture your next door neighbor's house and there's a huge chicken sitting on it like it's wanting to hatch their house like a nest. And neighbor's wife is actually in the house, can't get out because of this chicken. Okay, I'll go over those again. One is run, 
have no other gods before me. God's winning the race because he's not going to let anybody be ahead of him. To his shoe, take off your shoe, smash the idol, don't have idols. Three is tree, you don't carve God's name into a tree, that's taking the Lord's name in vain. Four is door, shut the door, why? It's a Sabbath. Five is dive, who are you trying to impress, who are you honoring with your dive? Your parents, honor your father and mother. Six is sticks, wailing on a murderer with your sticks. Seven is heaven. Sorry, adulterers, you can't go to heaven, according to my cartoon anyway. <laughs> so eight is gate. You, your gate keeps people from stealing stuff, but then they go steal your gate. So the eighth commandment is, thou shalt not steal. Nine is vine. Who swings in on the vine? A bear. He lands in the witness seat and starts to lie. Don't bear false witness. Nine is vine, ninth commandment. Don't bear false witness. Ten is hen, it's a chicken sitting on top of your neighbor's house. The neighbor's wife is inside it. You are not to covet or cover your neighbor's house or your neighbor's wife who happens to be in the house. Don't cover her like a chicken would cover it. Those are the Ten Commandments. If you spend ten minutes tonight going over these, you'll probably remember them forever. It really, it's, it's the way our mind works. We can remember what we see. Now, if you do it and you're like, I don't, rem- I don't know, I don't remember them at all, there's one reason. You didn't visualize it. You didn't actually see this happening. When you see, you know, the fifth commandment and you see yourself on that diving board and you see your parents there, you don't forget that kind of stuff. I mean, the cool thing is you're smarter than most congressmen Because if you just put a few minutes into this, you could say what the seventh commandment is, which is, what's the seventh commandment? Seven, seven. Adultery, you shall not commit adultery. You could say them odd, even, frontwards, backwards, once you put these little cartoons into your head. Now, in the time we have remaining, I just want to talk about each of these commandments that you've learned about and and give you some things to think about. Why, Why these 10? Why is it that God gave these as being the most central rules to a huge and impenetrable, you know, mass of of laws? It all starts with no other gods. Until you realize that God is exclusive, he's not just a God. He's not just one choice among many. God demands that we understand that he is really God. There are other gods, little g. There are other gods that people follow, but those gods can't save you. They can't help you. They can't lead and guide you. They're pretend. They're not real. In most cultures, they carve little images, which is we'll get into in the second commandment, but it's the idea of here's a god, but those gods can't hear. They can't speak. They can't do anything. So God's like, sorry, but you have to accept me as being the only God, or nothing else matters, nothing else works. The second commandment, no idolatry, it extends not just to carved little gods, but it refers to, see, God is spirit, and God is greater than all. He is out in front in the race, and he will have no other gods before him. But everything else in the universe besides God is material. So anytime we worship materialism, it doesn't have to be a carved little little God. Some people drive their God. Some people live in their God. Some people have a relationship that becomes their God, or their children become their God, or their job becomes their God. God says nothing that represents something that's more important than I am. No idols, period. No materialism, no icons, no nothing that takes on eternal significance. I am the only one who is significant for you. Everything else takes place behind that. So no idolatry, don't worship stuff. Then taking the Lord's name in vain, it it probably, you know, it wasn't likely in their culture that they would use God's name as a cuss word. 
In fact, they were afraid to even use God's name in church. When reading the Bible, they would change the word that was the name for Yahweh, that was the name for Jehovah God. Um, so it probably, they probably weren't walking around cussing. Um, certainly, if you use God's name in a way that, that shows you're not even thinking that it's God, um, that is certainly taking his name in vain. But taking his name is what you do when you say that you follow him. See, if you were Israel, a part of that name is El, which is God's name. So the idea was, just like for us, we say, I am a Christian. Okay, you are taking the name of Christ as being something that's a descriptor of who you are. And so I believe this commandment would let us know, if you are called a person of God, make sure that that means something to you. It doesn't mean that you're perfect. It doesn't mean that sometimes you might even slip and use his name in a bad way or say some other words that, that society might regard as inappropriate or do things that are going to be wrong. But the whole point of it is don't take his name and have that just be empty. Have it be that there's nothing about you that's different. There's nothing about you that really connects with who he is and what he wants to do. So if you take his name, I, there are times when I've told people, you know, the way you are, you might be better off just to shut up about being a Christian. Just don't tell people because you're such a bad example of what a Christian is. Now, we're all bad examples of Christians in some way, but the question is, does it even mean anything to you that you're a Christian or do you say that the way you say you're a Dodger fan or something? Don't take his name in vain. Keeping the Sabbath, it's an interesting command because we, and I think I said, keeping the Sabbath means you need to take a day off. That's something that goes all the way back to the beginning of creation. But there's something that, I, and I think definitely, I know this myself personally, when I don't take time off, when I don't extract myself from everything and really just have time alone with God, time to my own thoughts, time to unwind and relax, it's at my own peril. I damage myself when I do that. So that's a part of it. It doesn't matter if it's the seventh day. Paul said in Colossians, don't let people judge you about Sabbaths. Like, don't let people tell you which day should be your Sabbath. But at the same time, in being commanded to take a day off every week, which is, again, it's not, we're not under the law, but there's this principle behind it. But you know, there's another part of the Sabbath law that we ignore completely. The Sabbath law says you are to work six days, and on the seventh day, you are to rest. Being commanded to work six days is just as important as being commanded to take one day off. People who just don't work, people who just neglect that, people who their life is an entire Sabbath. There's one guy that I know that we always laugh about. It's like he's been on vacation for years and years. And it's like, that's not a life. You know, even if you're blessed enough that you don't need to work, you need to work. You need to have something be your work, something that you get involved in, volunteering or something, because we are designed to work and be productive for six days and then to take one day off. We can't mess that up too much without messing ourselves up. And that's, that's the Sabbath law, which is the fourth commandment. Honoring your father and mother. I, whenever I talk about this, people who had great parents are like, yeah, I totally get this. There are other people, if I say, imagine you giving your parents the award that you got for diving and saying, I dived just for you. And it's like, their stomach turns because their parents were really dishonorable kind of people. And we have to recognize that if our parents were super honorable, none of our parents were perfect. But if there's something that we can honor, if there's something that we can go, one thing I learned from my dad is this. One thing I got from my mom is this. Then honor them for that, appreciate that, and hold that as something that's valuable to you. But if there's literally, you know, you go, I, don't, I never knew my dad. He took off. How am I supposed to honor somebody that didn't even care enough to, 
support me or be there for me. And I, and I think that honoring someone, the word honor means to value. Sometimes you just have to be honest about somebody's value. Sometimes the way to honor them is to do better, is for you to become a better parent and a better person than they were. And it actually honors them. They contributed to you genetically. Now the best thing you can do for them doesn't even have to do with them. It has to do with you. That you can just go, the best thing that I can do is to use them as a negative example and try to do better myself. And that's honoring. Any parent that's worth anything, more than anything, they really want their kids to do better than they did. I mean, I know there are some who are like jealous of their kids and whatever, but ultimately, the way that I can honor my parents is to overcome the things that hindered me in the way that they were and to go ahead and make my life something that stands out there. Nothing would make me happier if I had horrible parents than for people to think I must have had good parents because I turned out so well. Um, honoring them. Murder is kind of self-explanatory. Um, a lot of times for murder, we don't even hit people with sticks, much less anything else. Um, adultery, uh, violating vows. Jesus really kicked this up a notch when he said, hey, you are showing adultery in your heart when you look at someone and lust after them. Understand this, when we are committed to someone, we have a we have a connection with them. And again, none of us are perfect. There's so much of an opportunity when you're married to learn how to forgive and to humble yourself. But at the same time, when it comes to faithfulness, when it comes to trying to keep your vows, and again, it's not just the vow to I won't sleep with somebody else. We promise to love and comfort and honor and keep each other. And those are promises that we need to take seriously. Of course, we need to remain faithful. But that faithfulness starts in our head long before it ever gets to the point where it's something that actually happens. Again, you, you destroy the institution of marriage when adultery becomes common practice. There are some countries today where adultery happens in like 50% of the marriages. Well, guess what? Marriage is being destroyed in those places. No marriage ever got better by someone committing adultery. That's never a good idea. It's never justified. If that's what you're going to do, do yourself and your spouse a favor and just divorce them. Don't stay committed to someone and then treat them that way. It's the most degrading thing that you can do, and so it's one of the Ten Commandments. Um, don't steal. Eight, gate, don't steal. Um, part of this isn't just taking something that belongs to somebody else, but how about doing a fair day's work for a fair day's wage? If you're flaking off at work, and instead of doing what you're being paid to do, you're goofing around on the internet, or you're like looking for ways to get out of work, you're skating uh, you know, in different ways, that's stealing, okay? That's something that, that God says, that's a violation to do that. Sometimes you're gonna goof off at work, make sure you make up for that work. Um, I, you know, I think that you know, ripping people off, uh, even if, you just, if it's in the name of getting a better deal. Um, sometimes that in itself is stealing, but we should really make sure that we're paying our fair way, that we're not mooching off people. You know, there are people who are like, they're always just trying to hint around to try to get somebody to give them something. That's stealing when you do that, and it's against the Ten Commandments. Um, bearing false witness doesn't just mean witnessing in a court, you know, perjuring yourself, but it's like, what do you bear or carry in the way of an accusation or a statement or a judgment against somebody else? Bearing false witness can be just looking at something that you see on the internet and sharing it before you even look into whether or not it's true. It's bearing false witness. I'm amazed how many people forward stuff to me that somebody sent to them, and they could have taken 30 seconds to look it up on Snopes.com, 
And the, I know some guys, everything they send me, Snopes already s said that it's not true. With all this political stuff that goes on too, it's like, be careful what you repeat. Don't even carry it. Don't transfer it. Don't allow gossip to just be, hey, I heard, I don't know if it's really true, but I heard this, and you know, it's like, you can take it for what it's worth. Don't take a chance at taking a story that isn't true and then you passing it along to someone else. Gossip is bearing false witness. It's something that is one of the things that's listed in Proverbs that God hates. And so don't bear false witness. And then coveting. You know, this doesn't just mean, coveting your neighbor's house doesn't just mean I want his house. Coveting your neighbor's wife doesn't just mean I want my neighbor's wife or my neighbor's husband. But there's more to it than that, often. I mean, just looking at their house and going, ooh, I wish I had that, that affects you in a way. But also, I think that there are some people who look at their neighbor and just wishes, I wish I was more like that person. I wish I was as skinny as her. I wish I was as successful as him. I wish I, we were as young as them. Or this business of, you know, so-and-so, they're just so nice to each other. Why aren't you like that? All of this is a violation of the 10th commandment. It's like comparing yourself with others. And what you're seeing in others is a totally phony version of who they are anyway. They're not like that when nobody's around, generally. But even if they are, if, they, if you find the perfect couple and you're like, wow, why can't we be more like them? That's coveting. That's, not, so that's saying, I don't want the relationship that I have. I don't want the stuff that I have. I want this guy's car, you know, this, this woman's abs. I want their you know, connection that they have with each other. I want his job. I want her clothes. It's, he, he winds up the Ten Commandments by just going, no, don't live your life wanting other people's stuff. You'll never be satisfied because you'll always find somebody else who has even cooler stuff. You'll always find somebody else who has an even better marriage or, an even, or even better kids who are more behaved or, you know, a better education or whatever. It's a trap. And so God says, don't do that. You do not judge who you are based on comparing yourself with others. Jesus said the Gentiles compare themselves among yourselves. It's not supposed to be that way with you. And so that's, you know, first commandment. No other gods before me. You're running and you're hitting the finish line. God is. Second commandment, smash those idols. Get rid of that materialism. Third commandment, don't take his name if it doesn't mean anything to you. Don't take his name in vain. You know, make sure that you pace yourself so that you work hard, but then you take a day a week to just play hard too and to, and to, to recreate and to, and to restore yourself. Not every day, just one is what he's asking. Um, and, and so, you know, on down through, hey, your parents live your life in such a way that you do life better than they do, and you can understand any good that came into your life because of your parents, and if there's absolutely nothing, then it starts with you. Um, don't kill people. Um, don't commit adultery, even in your heart. Don't steal Work hard, earn everything that you have. Don't try to get the best deal. Don't try to get the upper hand on somebody in every deal. Try to find a win-win. Make sure that when you tell a story, when you relay an event, that you're saying it as faithful to the truth as possible and don't repeat other people's baloney. And ultimately, be happy with who you are and what you have. Don't compare what you have with what anybody else has. That's coveting. Let's pray. Lord, thank you for the law. Every one of these Ten Commandments even. It's like, man, we're guilty of these a lot. It's easier to memorize them than it is to actually follow them. But help us to take them seriously. And help us to be those who follow the way that you tell us is the best way to live. 
I thank you for the law because it does let us realize that we could never be righteous. And it set us up for being desperate for a savior. But I thank you that we're not under the law now. That we don't have to live under that old covenant. That you have set us free. That you are our father. That Jesus is our savior. That his blood cleanses us from all sin. You've made it so easy. But help us to still follow the spirit of the law. Loving you with all our heart, soul, mind, strength and loving our neighbors as ourself. Help us to hold ourselves to those standards and to receive your grace and forgiveness when we fail to. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, guys, see ya.